Welcome back to the Kennedy Dynasty Podcast. I'm your host, Allison, and today I have got a long-awaited episode. I feel like I've had a few of those in a row. I feel like I've said that a lot lately, but for a long time, people have asked me to cover the life of Joseph P. Kennedy Jr., because there's really not a lot out about him. He's not really a heavily covered topic, apart from a few you know, statements what here and there about him and how he was supposed to take over and be president first, but then obviously Jack stepped in line next, and that's kind of the assumption. And that's really all I've ever learned of him before doing a little bit of research for this episode. So I'm going to be honest with you, there wasn't a significant amount of backstory into him, but there was definitely some things that I had never learned before, a little bit more in depth about his life and who he was. So we'll get into that in a minute, and I hope you enjoy the episode. But first, let's tackle our In the News segment. Big a news story of the past seven days. So this week, the Cape Cod Kennedy compound home was vandalized. Actually, not just the main home, but a few different ones, which was terrible. This is according to the Boston Herald. The Barnstable Police Department is investigating after three homes on the Kennedy compound in Hyannisport were vandalized earlier this week. According to the police, officers responded around 9 a.m. Wednesday morning to report vandalism at three residences on Marchant Avenue, as well as two vehicles parked at a residence on Island Avenue in Hyannisport. Marchant Avenue, a small cul-de-sac, is home to the famous Kennedy family compound, and a Barnstable police spokesperson confirmed that two of the three vandalized homes are associated with the Kennedy family. So there were shattered windows, things like that. It says the incident is currently under investigation and the motive of the vandalism is unknown at this time. Chris Kennedy said nobody likes to be attacked like that. The threat is real for us and he is obviously the son of Bobby Kennedy. He spoke to WHDH outside of the compound this week. He said, but the police have done a really good job investigating and we're pretty confident that whoever did this will come to justice. So it sounds like it doesn't really actually mention the main house there. It just says three of the Kennedy family home. So I'm not sure if it was the main one or not. But still, that's terrible. And hopefully they'll find whoever did it. All right, let's get to our question segment. Therefore, an answer to your question I have gotten asked a lot recently, actually. My DMs are pretty flooded with this question, which, by the way, if you DM me, I truly love it. I read as many, if not all of them, that I possibly can, but I cannot respond to all of them. My DMs are pretty flooded right now. It's just a busy time in my life. Holidays, you know, it gets pretty crazy. So I do try to read every message, and I so appreciate them. If you take the time to write me and say anything or compliment the podcast or give me suggestions, I truly, truly, truly appreciate that. So know that if you did not hear back from me on a DM, I probably did read it. I probably just didn't have the opportunity to respond, but I thank you beyond words for taking the time to write me. A common question that I get in my DMs though is what my favorite Kennedy books are because luckily, which I'm really happy about, it's one of the main reasons why I have this podcast is a lot of people find this and then get really interested in the Kennedys and want to know, well, where do I start as far as reading goes? There's a lot of books you can start with. I'm reading An Unfinished Life right now about JFK. It's a really good biography. I'm not too far into it, but I'm really enjoying what I've read so far. So I would highly recommend that. It's one of the most highly recommended. If you've been listening for a while, then you know that I am a huge Jackie fan. And I have to say my favorite Kennedy book I've read to date. Oh, that's that's a big statement. I'm keep reading more that I really do love. But my favorite that I've read to date is Miss Kennedy and Me by Clint Hill. I just think it's a really in-depth, beautiful look inside this family that was so, and still is, just highly publicized, so famous, ridiculously wealthy, all these things that are just full of glamour, but it's a really good, beautiful look inside their lives and the normalcy of their lives, even though that's hard to believe. And It's written from the perspective of Jackie Kennedy's Secret Service agent, Clint Hill, and his journey with her, and I just think it's a really, really well-written, great book. Another one that I've really enjoyed, even though it's so tragic, is Death of a President by William Manchester. That's one of the most classic books to date. It was written about the assassination and the aftermath and all those things, but it's a really, really very detailed, a very thoroughly researched story of everything coming together. So I have really enjoyed that one, although it's a very long read. And I'm a person that 
I can't just read through something quickly. I wish I could, but I, especially when it's a topic that I'm so interested in, I sit there and have to analyze every single thing about every single sentence. So if there's a sentence in Death of a President, for instance, that mentions whoever from the Dallas Police Department, then I in my head have to <laughs> literally connect the dots of where I've heard that name before or, oh, that person goes here and then I'll research. So it takes me 17 years literally to read a book, but that's one that's just really worth the time and the read. And it's gut-wrenching, but it's, a uh, I don't know, it's just really well done. And last but not least, I'll actually be inserting a clip from in this episode is the Arthur Schlesinger tapes with Jacqueline Kennedy, her conversations with him. They are by far the most in-depth way that I've been able to get into her mind, if that makes sense. She's such a private person and she recorded these tapes without the intention of them being heard for a really long time. And they were (laughs) withheld for a very long time until Caroline Kennedy decided to allow the public to kind of see into her life. And I'm thankful that she did because I've listened to them multiple times. It's just a really, really open and honest look at how Jackie Kennedy felt about a lot of things, which in turn, I feel like says a lot about how JFK may have felt about a lot of things because Arthur Schlesinger does interview her mostly on JFK's stances on a lot or what was going on with his presidency a lot. I almost wish he had asked a few more questions about her and how she felt, but she does give a lot of input there. So that is, I think this, that wraps it up. Those are my main ones. But if you listen to the tapes though, I would, I have the book and the um, audiobook. The book's great to have for reference reasons. For instance, I knew, I remembered that she had mentioned uh, Joseph P. Jr. in a in a moment with in the tape. So I was able to go pick up the book, look up his name, see where she mentioned it, and it took me directly to where it was. So then I was able to go to the tapes on Audible and know exactly where it was. So it helps me as far as um, getting the direct audio clip and where it's going to be for you guys. So the book's great too, but I would highly recommend listening on Audible so you can hear her actual voice and her inflections and the way that she uh, speaks about it. So I think I've mentioned all those before in different capacities, but uh, that's my roundup that definitely suggest that everybody, especially if you're interested in this family and learning more, read those. Let's get to our inspiring clip of the week. One of the inspiring notes. Now, I don't know how like inspiring this clip is, but I just thought it was cool to listen to. I, I like to go back to the debates every once in a while and just they're so iconic that uh, sometimes I find myself just researching and listening to the first presidential debate. So this one is a clip from the first debate between Kennedy and Nixon in 1960. Here in the United States, which developed the Tennessee Valley and which built the Grand Coulee and the other dams in the Northwest United States, at the present rate of hydropower production, and that is the hallmark of an industrialized society, the Soviet Union by 1975 will be be producing more power than we are. These are all the things I think in this country that can make our society strong or can mean that it stands still. I'm not satisfied until every American enjoys his full constitutional rights. If a Negro baby is born, and this is true also of Puerto Ricans and Mexicans in some of our cities, he has about one half as much chance to get through high school as a white baby. He has one third as much chance to get through college as a white student. He has about a third as much chance to be a professional man, about half as much chance to own a house. He has about the four times as much chance that he'll be out of work in his life as the white baby. I think we can do better. I don't want the talents of any American to go to waste. I know that there are those who say that we want to turn everything over to the government. I don't at all. I want the individuals to meet their responsibilities. And I want the states to meet their responsibilities. But I think there is also a national responsibility. The argument has been used against every piece of social legislation in the last 25 years. The people of the United States individually could not have developed the Tennessee Valley. Collectively, they could have. A cotton farmer in Georgia, or a peanut farmer, or a dairy farmer in Wisconsin or Minnesota, he cannot protect himself against the forces of supply and demand in the marketplace, but working together in effective governmental programs, he can do so. 17 million Americans who live over 65 on an average Social Security check of about $78 a month They're not able to sustain themselves individually, but they can sustain themselves through the social security system. I don't believe in big government. 
but I believe in effective governmental action. And I think that's the only way that the United States is going to maintain its freedom. It's the only way that we're going to move ahead. I think we can do a better job. I think we're going to have to do a better job if we are going to meet the responsibilities which time and events have placed upon us. We cannot turn the job over to anyone else. If the United States fails, then the whole cause of freedom fails. And I think it depends in great measure on what we do here in this country. The reason Franklin Roosevelt was a good neighbor in Latin America was because he was a good neighbor in the United States. Because they felt that the American society was moving again. I want us to recapture that image. I want people in Latin America and Africa and Asia to start to look to America, to see how we're doing things, to wonder what the President of the United States is doing, and not to look at Khrushchev or look at the Chinese Communists. That is the obligation upon our generation. In 1933, Franklin Roosevelt said in his inaugural that this generation of Americans has a rendezvous with destiny. I think our generation of Americans has the same rendezvous. The question now is, can freedom be maintained under the most severe attack, attack it has ever known? I think it can be. And I think in the final analysis, it depends upon what we do here. I think it's time America started moving again. All right, everybody, let's get to the episode. As I said before, it's about Joseph P. Kennedy Jr. Definitely recommend you going and looking up some stuff for yourself. Go see some photos and stuff after this episode. Maybe you can even find some more in-depth things than I was able to at this time. But I hope you enjoy what I have found. My main sources are the JFK Library and MPS. So let's get started. The basis of what we know about Joseph Patrick Kennedy Jr. is that he's the first child of Joseph P. Sr. and Rose, first of nine, and obviously (laughs) this family's expectations were out the roof. Can't imagine the pressure put on them all the time. And being the oldest, I especially can't imagine that, and the oldest boy. So in this time period and when this was, the, I would imagine, unbearable pressure of, of those two factors of being the oldest and being a male were pretty heavy for him. But he kind of seemed to always meet those expectations in every single way. And as we know, Joseph P. Kennedy Sr. was just so fond of Joe Jr., Jack, and Kick. Those were his three fave kids. And he had just really big hopes and big dreams for Joe in general. So let's get into a little bit of backstory about his childhood. He was actually born on July 25th, 1915 in Hull, Massachusetts. That's H-U-L-L. I'm so Southern. I may be pronouncing that incorrectly. That's how I read it. But he lived in Brookline with the rest of his siblings. JFK, when reflecting on the significant role that Joe had in his family, according to NPS, said very early in life, he acquired a sense of responsibility towards his brothers and sisters, and I don't think he ever forgot it. So I think that really leads into the amount of pressure and stuff that was probably put on him from a very early age. Also, according to NPS, he worked really hard in school and in sports, and he at first started attending the Edward Devotion School, which is now known as Florida Rough and Ridley and the private Dexter School. He also was an altar boy at St. Aidan's Church, and he always was very defensive of his family if they were ever in any way criticized about being Irish or of Catholic faith. From what I've read about him too, (laughs) all of this pressure, all of these things, all of these extracurriculars, if you will, that he was involved in did not take away that he was still very much a Kennedy, very mischievous, always crazy daredevil, doing all the things, jumping off the boats, playing pranks. I mean, that was just the Kennedy spirit that they had, and he very much had that as well, along with the rest of his siblings. I thought this was kind of funny from the article. Rose Kennedy said in her memoir that there was one time a sign at a restaurant that said, no dogs allowed, and Joe and his brothers changed it to say, no hot dogs allowed. And they also started a secret club initiating new members by sticking them with pins. Like, <laughs> what the heck? Just a couple mischievous kiddos for sure. Now, it was no secret that Joseph P. Sr. was preparing him for a life in politics. So because of that, he sent him to the Choate School, 
which is now known as Choate Rosemary Hall. And it's, um, I mean, JFK obviously went there as well, but it's super prestigious prep school in Connecticut. And he was a ridiculously good student, unlike Jack, (laughs) from what we know. He was just excellent. He had great leadership skills, got great grades. He always got the most praise and all the things. And he, I don't know, his parents were just super proud of him. He couldn't have been better as far as a student goes. And honestly, sounds like a son as well. With all that, he followed in the normal Kennedy footsteps and went to Harvard, which was uh, Joseph Sr.'s alma mater. But he had a really cool experience before he actually went there and took a year studying at the London School of Economics. And it says here that he studied alongside a professor, Harold Lasky, and with him, he learned economic theory, and he was able to travel throughout Europe to see how different economic systems functioned in practice. So after that adventure, he comes back, goes to Harvard in 1934, and he was always one to be into everything. And I have to say, I was not like that. I don't know why I'm inserting myself into this because, wow, I did not go anywhere even close to Harvard or anything like that. But I didn't do Greek life. I didn't do anything. I literally went to class. Sometimes we'll go to a party here and there, hung out with my friends or watched Grey's Anatomy in my dorm in my little like bottom bunk twin bed with a blanket over me weeping to whatever the episode was in Grey's Anatomy that week. So (laughs) I had a very different experience than old Joe Jr., but I'm not surprised by that, I have to say. According to this article, he served on the student council and he became a member of St. Paul Catholic Club, the Hasty Pudding Club, and Pi Ada. And of course, in true Kennedy fashion, played football and he played rugby. He graduated in 1938, and he went to London then, where Joseph Sr. was currently serving as the United States ambassador to the court of St. James in Britain. And then he decided, you know what, time for my own political career. So not long after that, uh, 1940 rolls around, and he starts serving as a delegate to the Democratic National Convention, and he was obviously hoping that eventually he'd be running for office himself. And obviously, as a lot of us know, September 30th, 1939, he walked to British Parliament with Jack and Kathleen to hear Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain declare war on Germany. So when this happened, Joe Jr. decided to completely put his political career on hold and join forces in World War II. This was something I found kind of interesting. Joseph Kennedy Sr. actually wanted to keep his boys out of the war, according to this article. I'm sure for their safety and continue their political career is my assumption. But Joe Jr. just recognized that he wanted to be a part of military service and it provides a lot of opportunities as well. So... NPS says that accordingly, he left Harvard University before his final year of law school to begin officer training in the U.S. Navy, and he became a naval aviator in 1942. Soon after earning his wings, Joe Jr. was sent to Britain in September of 1943, and he piloted land-based PB-4Y Liberator patrol bombers on anti-submarine detail. I'm going to be quoting a lot, actually, from here on out because I don't know military terminology very much, but it says, during his two tours of duty in the winter of 1943, to 1944, Joe Jr. was regarded as an experienced patrol plane commander, a well-respected fellow officer, and an expert in radio control. He refused to earn leave and instead volunteered for the most dangerous special assignments. One of his squadron mates said that Joe had everybody's unlimited admiration and respect for his courage, zeal, and willingness to undertake the most dangerous missions. And then in the summer of 1944, Joe Jr. volunteered for a secret bombing campaign with the code name Operation Aphrodite. His mission was to fly over Normandy, France in a radio-controlled B-17 bomber to a German V-2 rocket launching site, arm the explosives stowed on board, and then parachute to safety before the plane exploded over a German target. That is wild. So on the evening of August 12th, he and his co-pilot, Lieutenant Wilford John Willey, departed from the Royal Air Force First Field Station in Norwich, England. And as the plane headed to the North Sea coast, Kennedy prepared the plane for detonation and radioed the agreed code Spade Flush, his last words. Two minutes later, both men were able to eject from the plane. The explosives ignited prematurely and it killed Willie and Kennedy. The wreckage landed near the village of Blythburg in Suffolk, England, and the cause of the explosion was never concluded. And this was at the same time that JFK was actually recouping from his own war injuries, and that's when he heard the news of his big brother's death. And he apparently told a close friend that now the burden falls on me. And to honor Joe, John created a memorial book for his family titled We Remember Joe. And he wrote his worldly success 
was so assured and inevitable that his death seemed to have cut into the natural order of things. So, like I said, that was heavily quoted from NPS.gov. After Joe Jr. passed away, he was awarded the Air Medal and Navy Cross for his heroism. And in December of 1946, the Navy actually named a destroyer in his honor. This is pretty interesting. The naval destroyer that they named in his honor actually participated in multiple things, but it also was part of the U.S. naval quarantine of Cuba during the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis and space missions recovering Gemini 6 and Gemini 7. I just think it's interesting and really kind of full circle how the fact that his brother's memorial naval destroyer also helped along in JFK's presidency. I just find that really touching. It says that today the naval destroyer named after Joseph P. Jr., which is called the USS Joseph P. Kennedy Jr. DD-850, rests in Fall River, Massachusetts as part of the Battleship Cove Maritime Museum. And also, I'm pretty sure I've probably talked about this before, but Joseph P. Sr. and Rose created the Joseph P. Kennedy Jr. Foundation in 1946, which provides leadership in the field of intellectual disabilities and creates practical programs to benefit those with intellectual disabilities, their family, and their communities. Eunice and Teddy led the foundation until 2009. Even to this day, it continues to support and provide opportunities for individuals with intellectual disabilities. Now, a few things. I want to read a quote. This is directly from JFK Library. This was said by uh, John F. Kennedy about his brother. It says, His squadron, flying in the bitter winter over the Bay of Biscay, suffered heavy casualties, and by the time Joe had completed his designated number of missions in May, he had lost his former co-pilot and a number of close friends. Joe refused his preferred leave and persuaded his crew to remain on for D-Day. They flew frequently during June and July, and at the end of July, they were given another opportunity to go home. He felt it unfair to ask his crew to stay on longer, and they returned to the United States. He remained, for he had heard of a new and special assignment for which volunteers had been requested, which would require another month of the most dangerous type of flying. It may be felt, perhaps, that Joe should not have pushed his luck so far and should have accepted his leave and come home. But two facts must be borne in mind. First, at the time of his death, he had completed probably more combat missions and heavy bombers than any other pilot of his rank in the Navy and therefore was pre- preeminently qualified, and secondly, as he told a friend early in August, he considered the odds at least 50-50, and Joe never asked for any better odds than that. One more thing I want to comment on, too, and I'm going to insert a clip from, as I said earlier at the beginning of this episode. So, the most common assumption, just to recap, is that Joe Jr. was the one that was the chosen one by Joe Sr. to run for president. That's just commonly stated in probably every Kennedy documentary, every Kennedy biography, everything that you ever read. And I find it kind of interesting because that was actually contradicted a bit in the tapes that Jackie recorded with Arthur Schlesinger. And I don't know if this was a biased opinion because obviously Jack was such a profound presidential figure and obviously the love of Jackie Kennedy's life. So I don't know if her statement is necessarily biased because of that or she was trying to kind of change the narrative on that a little bit. And Arthur Schlesinger seems to some would agree with what she says. So before I keep talking, I'm just going to play the clip of a conversation about this particular topic on if Joe Jr. was the one that was supposed to be the chosen child for presidency. So here it is. Is, is the story true? It's been sometimes printed that the an ambassador originally thought of, expected Joe to be the great political figure of the family. And... Well, that's the sort of trite story that all these people who used to go to interview Mr. Kennedy... You get so tired of people asking for anecdotes. And he'd always produce this thing that Joe would have. And well, now how can I say? Because I never knew Joe. And uh, obviously, I suppose Joe would have run for politics. And then Jack, being so close to him, couldn't have run right on his heels in Massachusetts. Maybe he would have gone into something literary. Um, But it's just not as simple as that story sounds. And then once Joe was dead... um, You know, Mr. Kennedy didn't do any strange thing of saying, okay, now we run you. Everything just evolved. They came back from the war. I don't know. I agree. That's the story. It's always sounded to be too pat and mechanical. And and, and, uh, Joe was a classmate of mine at Harvard. Oh, yeah. But... uh, I've got a feeling uh, from what I think of Joe and everything that... um, He would have been so unimaginative compared to Jack. He would never have, I think he probably would have gotten to be a senator and not much higher. 
I don't know if that's prejudice, but I don't think he had any of the sort of imagination that Jack did. And well, that was certainly, I, I knew him moderately well, and he did not have the uh, imagination or the intellectual force or intellectual interest. He was the most attractive, charming fellow and would have been, I think, very successful in politics. But I don't think that area ever carried things to the, to the point the president would. So as you can see, I just feel like Jackie was kind of saying that's not really necessarily the case. It was never like, you know, he was born into automatically going to be the one to run for president. I don't know. It was just a very interesting clip that I had remembered. And when I started to prep for this episode, I just thought that I would include that in there. I thought it was a different take on that particular narrative. So do with it what you will. I think we can see from this episode that Joe Jr. was a really incredible human being, a very brave and wonderful leader and excellent and studious and smart and really fit the bill for a Kennedy, a Kennedy and what Joe Sr. and Rose would have wanted for their children and raised them to be. So anyway, I just, I've really enjoyed studying him a little bit more and finding out just how really brave he was. And the fact that he, I, I don't know, I think it's pretty cool that he put his political ambitions aside and fought for our country. That's one of the most amazing things you can do. And I just am thankful that he did that. I hope you enjoyed today's episode and I hope you learned something new. If you like the episode and the podcast in general, make sure you're subscribed. Please rate it five stars and write a positive written review on Apple Podcast. Those really, really help me so, so much. So I'd really appreciate you taking the time to do that. And if you don't have time to do that, just tap that five stars on the Apple Podcast as well. That really helps too. Also check out my Amazon recommendation site. I will link it below. I've got a really exciting episode for you next week. Like I said before, make sure you're subscribed and I will talk to you guys soon. And vote for Kennedy, vote for Kennedy, keep America strong.